All right, welcome to the Georgia Lacrosse Officials Association presentation on game management. This is using the 2020 NFHS Boys Lacrosse rules. So there are four keys to success to successfully managing a game. Um, and I, I use the word managing very intentionally. We do not control the game. We do not prevent players from doing something. We do not prevent coaches from doing something. We simply react to what is happening. Um, hopefully we can do some what we call preventative officiating and um, help to manage their behavior, but we don't control it. Uh, the four keys to success are you have to look the part. If you don't look professional and you don't look as if you're taking this um, responsibility seriously, uh, you're going to lose a lot of credibility in the eyes of the players, the fans, your crew members, um, and the coaches. You have to be in proper position. Uh, I can't say this enough. You can be in the right spot and make the wrong call, and you're not going to have a problem. If you are in the wrong spot and you make the right call, you have a lot of trouble selling it to people. Um, communicate effectively. Um, making sure that people have the information they need. They understand what you actually called. Um, we tend to bring a lot of issues on ourselves as officials because we do not communicate effectively with coaches and players. Um, coaches yelling about one thing, you're yelling about a different thing, uh, it's really important as part of communicating that you listen to what coaches are asking you, what their concerns are. They may not like the answer that they get, but let's make sure we're answering the right question. And you got to know the rules. Um, there is no experience and no replacement for um, really understanding the rules knowledge. You got to get in the rule book. You got to read these rules over and over and over again. You got to look at the different situations. Um, it's there's a lot of weird stuff in this rule book, and um, you know you have to know what your options are when you're calling a game. So you control these factors. Um, get your uniform in, in place. Make sure you are in the proper position. Work on your signals and get in the rule book. Um, again, with the rules, it's assumed that you know these. Uh, you shouldn't be on the field if you don't. Um, so really make a concerted effort to, to jump in that rule book. With game management, I, I definitely, um, I love this quote. Uh, Dean Martin uh, sort of hits the nail on the head. Whether or not he said this, I am unclear, but uh, it's a good meme. Good judgment comes from experience, and experience, well, that comes from poor judgment. Um, we have all had the game that got out of control. We have all officiated a game where fights break out, and you eject coaches, and everybody's screaming at everybody, and it's just a terrible, terrible, terrible experience. Um, what you do is you try to learn from that, and you try to not make the same mistakes. Um, it is often officials, again, who are responsible for these sort of situations that get out of control because we're giving the wrong signal. We're not following the rules. We're communicating poorly. We're not in the right spot. Um, and, you know, these are emotional games, and, and people really take this seriously. So when you, when you do this, you've got to bring it. Um, but that being said, you're going to screw stuff up. And the key is to try to learn as much as you can from the experience, to call your trainers, to call your mentors, to call your um, uh, fellow officials and try to break down what you could have done differently. Um, and it's not to say that you're never going to have that situation again, but hopefully you're not making the same mistake that put you in that position. The first thing you need to understand about game management is what is the level of play? We are not going to officiate the game on the left the same way that we officiate the game on the right. Um, and it's not just that the rules and the ages are different. Level of play also includes the ability of teams to handle the ball. Um, teams that can't catch and throw uh, tend to get really physical. There's a lot of slashing. There's a lot of physical checks. Uh, and you're going to officiate that game differently. Um, games where the ball's on the ground the entire time. You have to understand um, that it's important to get the ball up into people's sticks. Uh, and, and we'll talk about that. Um, a college game is not the same as a high school game. Um, you know, two really good teams in high school playing each other is different than um, uh, two crummy teams in high school. So uh, level of play really factors into how we um, are going to manage our games. 
So what are the types of games that you can have, right? You can have the rivalry game. Um, if you've been to uh, the Stars Mill uh, Macintosh game, it is a, it's a pretty big deal. The stands are packed. Everybody's there. Um, it, it's a really raucous atmosphere. Um, and usually some crazy stuff happens in these games. Um, but you've got to understand when, you know, Lovett plays Westminster and Stars Mill plays Macintosh, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of, you know, emotion and energy and sometimes bad blood between these teams. You can't assume it's just your everyday ordinary game. Playoff games. This is one and done. Um, these kids have worked sometimes their entire um, lacrosse careers trying to get to the playoffs. These coaches have put in hours and hours of work trying to get to the playoffs. Um, and it is, it's a big deal. Uh, this is why, you know, when you get the opportunity to work those playoff games, you should really understand what you're getting into um, and make sure you're putting in the equal amount of effort. The blowout game. Um, you know, these are games that can really quickly get out of hand um, because one team just doesn't care anymore. Um, and the other team is often egging them on and um, sort of taunting them. And so these can be really challenging games. Um, uh, oftentimes I've, I'm told that the officials who want to move up don't want to do um, these crummy games um, that are 10 to nothing and running clock. Well, to be honest, we need really good officials on those games because they're the ones that spiral out of control. Um, and if you can't manage that, um, you know, what makes you think you can do the big time rivalry game or the playoff game? Um, Blowouts are a testing ground for officials. Uh, can you keep it going smoothly and fairly and and not lose control? And finally, the tournament games, the sort of summer tournament games that we do. You know, these kids come down and they're playing on quote unquote elite youth teams and, you know, they want to win the Kennesaw Cup or whatever it is. Um, those games bring their own sort of unique things uh, to the table. So, uh, the route, the blowout game, um, eyes on the inmates. Um, you have to pay attention during dead ball because that's the stuff that when soup and stuff really happens. Um, preventative officiating. Make sure they know where you are. Make sure you're in the mix. Make sure you're in between mixed colors. Talk to them. Um, you know, in a lower level game, you can ask a coach who's getting beaten if he wants to shorten the game. Um, if you're in a running clock situation, take your time restarting play. Remember, uh, any time we have a 10 goal differential now in, in a GHSA contact, contest, we're going to go to a running clock. Um, you know, if there's 15 seconds left in the quarter um, and the faceoff guys have been trying to kill each other all day, you know, maybe we take a long, slow walk to the to the face-off X, um, and then the clock expires, and golly gee willikers, we just can't do this face-off. Um, that's, a, that's a way to kind of manage the game. Um, uh, you know, the score has been determined. We're not having an impact on that, um, but kind of understand what you're dealing with. Remember, any time we have uh, a 10-goal differential now. The playoffs. Now, teams tend to be more evenly matched. Um, more so in the later rounds in Georgia. Um, and the importance of the game tends to make players play more in control, right? Since nobody wants to sort of make the mistake that, that costs his team the win. Um, but you can't assume that. Um, you know, again, the the emotion uh, uh, really gets a hold. Um, you know, oftentimes teams have not really been in this situation before. Um, and so they don't really know how to handle the pressure um, and the, and their emotions get the best of them. Um, you got to understand that that's potentially coming. Right. Um, and so when things get crazy, officials need to be really calm. It's, 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 we are the ones who need to be cool and calm and collected, you know, um, Make sure you're constantly monitoring what's happening in the game. One of the things I tell officials is, is you might come in thinking this is going to be a really close game or a blowout, and you end up with the exact opposite. Uh, you know, Give yourself as much information as you can on the teams going into a situation, but don't assume that's the way it's going to play out. Constantly reassess with your crew what game are you really dealing with. Tournament games, multiple games in one day. Uh, kids are physically, emotionally exhausted. So are the fans, so are the officials, so are the spectators, so are the coaches. 
Um, tired players play sloppy lacrosse. Um, they play defense with their sticks instead of their feet and their heads, and it leads to more fouls. So make sure that you understand if you're doing the fifth game of the day, um, that there is definitely the potential for some shenanigans, um, that everybody's not fresh and excited anymore, right? Rivalry games. Um, these games come in a variety of styles. Uh, they can be played between schools that are traditional rivalries in other sports, uh, maybe in lacrosse only, uh, history of bad blood from a previous incident, or they just don't like each other for whatever reason. Um, make sure you're really prepared going into that game. This is the game where you want to do, uh, you know, a really good pregame. You want to have a scouting report. You want to talk to other officials about what the game, uh, what the teams were doing previously. Uh, we have a vast library of film that you can look at now. So you can request some film from one of the film committee guys. Uh, just shoot us an email. Um, but this is, again, information that you really want to be on top of. Weather can really affect your game, right? Uh, under NFHS rules, we're allowed to call extra timeouts, officials timeouts, if we feel like the heat is really getting out of control. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're dealing with 110 degrees and high humidity in the summer, call an extra timeout. Give the kids a chance to go get some water. Again, tired players play sloppy lacrosse, and sloppy lacrosse tends to have more fouls. Communication. Right. Coaches need and deserve information. You point a direction um, and you don't really clearly say which way it's going or you don't hold your point for very long or you say the wrong color. Um, a coach has seven seconds or so to decide what personnel he's sending out on the field. Um, you know, you've had a couple of crease calls in a row. Um, you seem to be the only one with a face-off violation. You better make sure you are communicating to that coach as soon as possible what's going on. Um, because what happens is, is the issue starts to fester, and now the coach feels like not only are you screwing him over, but you are ignoring him. Now, he may not like what you have to say, uh, but that doesn't mean you don't need to say it. Um, if somebody is stepping in the crease and then there's contact, Go in there and tell them that. Um, if somebody is moving after you say set and you've talked to them numerous times about it and you went over it in the pregame meeting with the faceoff guys, make sure you're communicating that. Um, you know, let him then coach his player as opposed to just fume at you because you don't seem to know what you're doing, right? Um, communication to crew, players, table, and coaches is critical. Uh, there's no one way to do this. Right. Some of us are a little more gruff than others. Some of us are very quiet and smooth. Some of us are um, loud and boisterous. Um, you have to find a style that works for you. So watch other officials as they interact with coaches and as they talk to the table and as they try to calm things down. Um, and, you know, how thick is their skin? What are the phrases that they use? These are all things that you can really learn from. Um, uh, as you go forward and um, grow as an official. So again, communication. If somebody asks you a question nicely, just answer the question, right? Um, uh, again, we don't respond to statements. We answer questions. Um, relationships can change quickly. Um, you need to manage that, right? A coach who's been fine all game long suddenly doesn't like a call that that has been made at a critical time in the game, and he can become, um, uh, you know, a problem for you. Um, again, remember, you will deal with these coaches again. Coaches go from one school to another. They go from assistant coaches to head coaches. They go from high school coaches to college coaches. Um, uh, the biggest thing is we're going to keep a professional, open-ended relationship. We're going to communicate information um, in a timely manner. Um, and when things get heated, we keep our cool. In a lot of pregames, when you're working with an official, you will hear, hey guys, let's make sure we get a good first flag. Um, and what your your referee is really saying here is that the first flag is going to set the bar for the game. You as a crew need to make sure that um, if it's a 50-50 push and, and you would have passed on it, but your partner threw the flag, that means 50-50 pushes are now flags today. Um, you as a crew need to be consistent. We don't want 
two or three guys out on a field, each calling their own game. Um, you want to discuss this in the pregame. What are you going to? What kind of game do you think you're going to have, and what are you going to allow to have happen? Um, I've heard many an official say, "We're going to let them play until they need us to step in," um, and you're going to reassess this throughout the game with your partner. Um, I, again, be consistent as a crew. Mistakes by officials. Um, you're going to confer with your partner and correct mistakes um, uh, before it has an impact on the game. Pointing in the wrong direction, inadvertent flag or whistle, uh, blown call um, by um, somebody, a misapplication of a rule. If a mistake is made, slow down. That is the most important thing. Um, Don't speed up and make it worse, right? We don't want to compound an error. The key is that we get it right. All right, so what do you do with mistakes by officials? Um, well, if the timekeeper, scorer, or official make a mistake, promptly correct it, right? If there's a... If the clock isn't working, there's not an imminent scoring opportunity, stop the play. Get the clock running or get the clock stopped, whatever the case may be. Um, if you see the wrong score on the scoreboard, you know, you can say, oh, yeah, that's fine. We'll make sure it gets fixed, right? Little stuff like that um, is easy to fix, and it goes a long way to building your credibility. Hey, that guy was paying attention. Hey, I had a concern, and he addressed it immediately. Um if a goal is scored during a play after, let's say, a bad restart um, or inappropriate awarding of the ball, you pointed the wrong direction, um, the mistake needs to be brought to the attention of the referee before the next live ball, um, and the referee must allow or disallow the goal depending upon the circumstances. So if everybody's aware of the ruling and had sufficient time to call attention to the mistake, it must be made before the next live ball. If the officials do not have sufficient time, for example, it's a quick restart, um, the correction must be made before the second live ball. However, once a face-off occurs, no prior goals may be disallowed. Right? Um, if, as an official, you think something's wrong with the way things are going, blow your whistle and ask the question. Right? Um, it's a great habit to get into to be whistle, whistle, whistle. Hey, Greg, did you mean to point blue? Is it blue ball? Because I had a tip. And I can yell across, yes, I did. Now you've told everybody, look, we've confirmed, we've double checked. This is the way the call is going to go. Right. That goes a long way to fixing things before they go south. If, however, you know it is... You definitely pointed the wrong direction. Whistle, whistle, whistle. Hey, Greg, it was off blue. It should be white ball. I got no problem with that. All right, guys, we're going white. Inadvertent whistles. Um, I will tell all the basketball officials, do not run down the field with the whistle in your mouth. Right? This is why we wear finger whistles. Um, the team that had um, or was entitled to possession keeps possession. So if there's a flag down... Um, and you killed it early, they're going to keep that ball because th they had a flag down. Um, if you have a play on um, and somebody kills it, um, they're now entitled to the ball. They're going to keep it. If they are in possession, carrying, cradling, passing, shooting, they're going to keep the ball. Uh, if the ball is loose in the crease when we have an inadvertent whistle, award possession to the defense. Um, big thing here. If we have a shot on goal and you're not 1,000% sure that that ball is in the net, don't blow your whistle. Come running in. That's why we need to be really close on the crease because if a team shoots and the ball's on the side of the net and they have a chance to get the ball out from the side of the net before the goalie does and you blow your whistle because you think it's a goal, you're just giving the ball to the defense. Um, you're taking away a possession potentially from the offense. So really make sure uh, that you know a goal has been scored before you blow that whistle. If the ball is loose outside the crease when we have an inadvertent whistle, we're going to award by alternate possession. Um, 
don't keep the whistle in your mouth. That's the big takeaway here. Inadvertent flags. Um, you throw a flag because you think somebody's offsides, you count, you count again, you realize they're not offsides. Um, you want to stop the play as quickly as possible unless there is an imminent scoring opportunity. Remember, if you throw a flag, the team that gets the free play thinks whatever they do, they're going to get the ball. So they may take a shot that's a little more risky because they know they're going to be man up in a second. Um, so you want to make sure you stop it um, unless there's an imminent scoring opportunity to fix the mistake. Um, own up. Uh, this goes with, with inadvertent whistle. If you kind of blow your whistle, do not think to yourself, well, nobody heard that. Right? If the defender stops, to pl stops playing because he thinks he heard a whistle and the offensive guy didn't, you've just disadvantaged the defensive guys. Um, own your mistakes. Right? Um, if team A has possession at the time of the flag, they're going to keep possession. If the ball is loose outside the crease, award by AP. If the ball is in the crease, award to the defense, right? This is why when we throw flags for offsides, we're often a little late because it's better to be late and right than early and wrong. Don't start play until the crew's in agreement on what happened and how to fix it when you've screwed something up right? Uh, again, we slow down here. Uh, make sure both head coaches understand what happened. Hey coach, we pointed the wrong way. It was af actually off of blue. It's going to be white ball. We're going this way. Please substitute whoever you need to substitute. Um, everyone needs to know who gets the ball and where the ball is going to be restarted, right? Coach, ball's going to be on the 15-yard line in the alley on the right side. Uh, both teams definitely get 20 seconds to substitute and set up right don't compound the error by having two teams running their offense and their defenses out on the field everybody's offsides and there's too many men right get it right clean it up explain to everybody what's going on and then restart play now the coach can challenge a call um and, you know, what you want to do here is you've got the double tap of the horn. You'll go into um, you'll go into the uh, the coach's box with both coaches um, and you're going to start your two minute timer. Um, if you're if the referee is not convinced of the argument within 140. Right. You're going to assess a timeout to that team. And if they don't have a timeout, they're going to get a technical foul um, for delay of game. Uh, and then you're going to, you know, uh, if they do have a timeout, right, after the timeout, you'll restart with 20 seconds. Um, the key here is they can't argue a judgment call. They can argue misapplication of a rule, right, that you didn't award it based upon how many people had penalty time or whether a flag down carried over, something like that. It's got to be a rules challenge, not a judgment challenge. I didn't think that was a push, and you did. Um you know, these happen, and uh, as the referee, you got to be ready. This is where knowing your rule book is really important um, because you've got to get it right. You can't just make stuff up at this point in time. There are no challenges after the game ends. There are no stick checks after the game ends. All right, this is the big takeaway here. Um, when you're dealing with poor behavior... There are a number of options you have for behaviors, particularly from the bench, um, but even from players. Uh, you want to work through these steps in order. Uh, you don't want to go nuclear the first time somebody says you did a terrible job, um, because then you have nowhere else to go for the rest of the game. Your goal, again, is to manage the game. If you don't want somebody to do something, let them know that you're not going to allow that to happen and that you are willing to escalate consequences for that type of behavior. Um, now, sometimes you do need to skip steps, right? Taunting, racist behavior, um, you know, what we call flagrant misconduct. Uh, that you can go straight to three-minute non-releasable on sportsman likes or even ejection. Um, but here's how we start. Verbal warning. Coach, I, I don't want to hear any more. Um, you know, we're done with that conversation. We're going to move along. Or I really don't want you doing that again. Um, please don't run on the field. Those kind of things. Uh, you give a verbal warning. 
if that's not working, you, you kind of want to start with a loose ball conduct foul, right? Somebody's chirping at you from the sidelines, and they're just not letting it go. Um, they're talking about what a terrible job you've done and that you don't know the rules. Um, if the ball's loose, just award it to the other team. Uh, nobody serves a penalty. Um, we're still playing six on six, but you've taken a possession away and given it to the other team, right? Um, this is the, the sort of lowest level consequence that you can give. Finally, you can do a conduct foul with B in possession. If the other team's in possession and team A's coach is, is doing what you don't like, throw a flag. Give B a flag down slow whistle. If they score, Nobody serves a penalty. If they don't score, team A is going to serve uh, 30 seconds, and B is going to be man up. Then you can get to Rule 510, unsportsmanlike conduct, right? Um, if we're continuing to do sort of the same thing, now we got to escalate it up. Um, and this is going to be a one to three minute non releasable penalty. Um, if it uh, escalates, if it is a player, um, it can be, it's going to be a three minute non-releasable for the ejection. If it is a coach, it is going to be a one minute non-releasable ejection. Uh, remember, we're, we're really not punishing the players anymore by ejecting the coach. Um, so that is definitely in your tool bag. Um, going through these steps is really important. If you're, if you've got an issue, you have to address it early and make very clear with your verbal warning where your line is. Um, and keep re-emphasizing where that line is. And when they cross over, if you don't act, they're going to keep doing it. Um, so you don't want to get into this, um, you know, throwing a zillion unsportsmanlike conduct fouls in the fourth quarter if you have not gone through these steps in the first, second, and third quarter. Um, use the ramp. The ramp will solve most of your problems. You're still going to have to eject people. You're still going to have people lose their minds. Um, but this is your tool bag for dealing with bad behavior. I highly recommend that you go to the Georgia Lacrosse Officials Association YouTube page and watch uh, PJ Colello's presentation he gave on dealing with poor behavior um, at the U.S. Lacrosse Convention in 2018. It's one of the best presentations I've heard um, on how to handle coaches um, and how to handle the bench and how to handle players. Um, really good stuff. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great listen. As I said, Penalty time for players is three minutes. The penalty time for coaches is now one minute. Um, that's rule 512-1. Fights. Um, nobody thinks fights are a big deal until you've been in one of these. Um, you got to get in early and stop it before it starts. This is why we have eyes on the inmates during dead balls. You have to be in the crease when you signal goal uh, because you've got a lot of mixed colors. Somebody's really happy. Somebody's really angry. That's a lot of energy and emotion in a very tight knit area. Um, you want to make sure you're in between those players as teams are coming to the sideline um, after a timeout or between quarters. You need to be the official that is at the wing line, um, at the tee, making sure you have eyes on everybody. Um, uh, because fights tend to happen um, during dead balls. Um, they will often happen as retaliation um, for a big hit or a big slash. Even though you've thrown the flag, um, the inclination is to turn and sort of you know, confront your oppressor. So uh, we want to make sure that we're, uh, when we see that big hit, we're running in. Don't just turn and start signaling to your crew. Um, you need to run in and make sure you are looking at the players and you are getting in between them, blowing your whistle. A Fox 40 finger whistle in, in the ear hole will get people's attention. Um, uh, if you don't want to get in between them to separate them, you do not have to. Um, but we're going to need to remember color and number of players involved and the sequence uh, of what happened, and we're going to need to get uh, player names and numbers if there is a fight. Uh, remember, attempting to throw a punch, you do not have to land a punch, is an ejectable offense. Um, leaving the bench um, and running out to engage in a fight is an injectable offense. 
So fight mechanics and two man. Um, if you're the trail official um, and a fight breaks out, right? The first thing you do is freeze the benches. You turn and you very loudly and angrily tell everybody to stop. Um, both hands up, blowing your whistle. Your partner should come in and get in between everybody else. But you don't want 30 guys on the field. Um, uh, you know, that's a lot harder to handle than 10 guys on the field um, in, in your particular area. And then finally, game management. There is going to be the time when you uh, get to a site and your partner has car trouble or didn't know about the game or bailed on you, um, and you have to do singles. So there's a couple of ways you can do it. Um, you can get a couple of people on the far sideline to sort of tell you when it goes out of bounds and who it went after, and you move up and down the field on the other side. Um, or you can get your head coaches to do it, and you can kind of go to the far sideline. Um, this is not an enviable position. It is really hard to do a single in a high-level game. Um, this is why we want to make sure we have confirmation from our partners 48 hours beforehand, and you are in contact with them on game day as soon as you arrive at a site, um, so that if there is an issue, potentially you can call your assigner and get somebody else out um, to run the game with you. All right, thank you so much for listening. Uh, again, these are a series of presentations we use for our two-man mechanic training for rookies. Uh, they're available uh, online at galaxraft.com, and you can also find these other videos at um, the GLOA YouTube page. Thanks so much.